Good afternoon, and um, I would like to thank Dave Lozada for inviting me. Um, and uh, uh, I would like also to thank uh, Miss Alfaro because she was my former student uh, for uh, moderating this short uh, sharing uh, this afternoon. And I would like to thank Brielle because Brielle will be my uh, uh, big help when I do my presentation. Okay, so um, I would like to share uh, about, and this is being a month of March, usually it's the month uh, focused on women. And uh, so it is timely that we now uh, remember uh, women and particularly women of Manila in the 19th century. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Uh, first, uh, okay. The objective of the presentation uh, is to find out the principal occupations of women in the suburbs of Manila in the 19th century. Uh, and this one as found uh, in uh, the Vicindarios. This is the primary source that I used uh, and the vicindarios are list of inhabitants uh, of a particular place, no? And uh, at a particular time, and this would be during the years of 1886 to 1887. So uh, um, the next slide, please. This is how it looks. Um, when you take a look at the vicindarios, which I did, uh, the, the idea is to really extract the principal occupations of women. And I would really like to thank for the first time and probably publicly, my uh, research assistants, uh, particularly um, uh, Mr. Dennis Santiago and uh, uh, Maria Cleofe Marpa. They are friends of Chas Navarro and my friends eventually. And you know, they really painstakingly went through the vicendario of Tundo, Binondo, Santa Cruz, Quiapo, et cetera, up to Paco. And this is how it came out. That's how they, they extracted and uh, tried to make sense of the vicendario. So for example, you have the names of the individuals because each vicindario, for example, in Tondo, will be divided into cabecerias. So there will be many cabecerias in one particular Arabal, or to, for example, Tondo. So you have the names of uh, the individuals, women particularly, because I asked them to please get just women. So the first column, uh, the, you first, uh, you have the names, then you have three columns. The first column is labeled edad, also the age of the individual or the woman. The second column is labeled estado or status. And they would, uh, they made a, um, uh, a coding that letter A will refer to casada or married woman, letter B will be soltera or a single woman, and letter C will be labeled viuda, no? uh, which would be a uh, widow. Then the third column there is labeled officio. So for this particular vicindario of Tondo, number one was their code for costurera, number two was their code for cigarera, number three, lavandera, and number four, tindera. So this is how it looks. Just, this is just a sample. And really it's, it's not a joke uh, because they had to go through all the vicindarios and make this kind of um, uh, organizing no? uh, of uh, women, their ages, their status, and their officials. Next slide, please. Now, I will be referring to the Arabales of Manila. Of course, during the Spanish period, uh, Intramuros was Manila. No? And so when they refer to the Arabales of Manila, these are the places or the, yes, places outside the walled city. And uh, so they call it Arabales de Manila or Suburbios de Manila. 
And we find north of the Pasig River the following Arabales, Tondo, Binondo, Santa Cruz, Quiapo, San Paloc, San Miguel. And the south of the Pasig River will be the Arabales of Ermita, Malate, and Paco de Lao. So you can just imagine how they tried to make sense. They were now uh, organizing nine Arabales. No? Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, this is just a map no, of uh, Manila and its Arabale. So you have the Pasig River there traversing uh, Manila. And when I refer to north of the Pasig, so it's all these places of Tondo, uh, Binondo, up to San Palo and San Miguel. So south of the Pasig River will be, of course, your Ermita, Malate, and Paco. No? Okay, next slide, please. Okay. So when they collated it, um, the population of women with identified occupation per Arabales was this. No? So Tondo had a big woman, I mean, population of women uh, and Binondo. Uh, so 3,301 for Binondo. Tondo was 3,042. And uh, next will be uh, Sampaloc, uh, Paco de Lao and uh, so on. No? So heavy ang kababaihan sa so madaling sabi for Tondo and Binondo. Next slide, please. Now the leading occupations of women per Arabales, I mean, this now is extracted from an examination of the Vicendarios. Tondo had the following uh, leading occupations, cigarera, tindera, costurera, operaria, lavandera. Binondo, costurera, cigarera, lavandera, tindera, jornalera. Uh, next slide, please. Santa Cruz, costurera, cigarera, lavandera, tindera. Quiapo, costurera, cigarera, lavandera, tindera. Next slide, please. San Palo, cigarera, lavandera, costurera, tindera, jornalera. Uh, San Miguel, Costurera, Cigarera, Lavandera. Next slide, please. Now we go to the south of the Pasig River. You would have leading occupation of Ermita, Costurera, Cigarera, Bordadora, Lavandera, Tindera, Malate, Bordadora, Costurera, Cigarera, Lavandera, Tindera. And lastly, Paco, uh, Costurera, Cigarera, Lavandera, and Tindera. Okay, so next slide we will see that the leading occupations will be four. Cigarera, present in all Arabales, but heavily coming from Tundo and Binondo. Custorera, present in all Arabales, but dominant in Binondo, Tondo, Paco, Quiapo, and Ermita. Lavandera, present in all the Arabales, but dominant in San Palo, Quiapo, Tondo, Ermita, and Quiapo. Tindera present in all Arabales, but heavy in Tundo, Binondo, and Sampalo. So these are the four uh, leading occupations. Next slide, please. But there would be occupations of women unique to a particular Arabal. And uh, this would be seen uh, in Capo, where you will have women engaged in the making of articles from silver. They were called plateras. And the Nakpil family, uh, the women family members of the Nakpils were plateras. No? And uh, another uh, occupation unique in the uh, Arabales would be bordadoras or embroiderers found mostly in the Arabales of Ermita and Malate. No? Okay, next slide, please. Now we go first to the cigarera, which uh, seemed to be a principal occupation of uh, women at the time. Now a, a cigarera is defined as a woman who is employed to roll cigars. And this uh, cigarera would emerge uh, when the colonial government established the tobacco monopoly in 1781 during the time of Governor General Jose de Vasco y Vargas and was abolished in 1882 during the time of Governor General Primo de Rivera. So it lasted for a year or for a century almost. No? 
And women were engaged to roll cigars because they were reputed to be honest, meaning not prone to smuggling out cigars from the factory and were very adept of rolling cigars. Uh, I mentioned this because the men were engaged in the making of cigarettes. No? The factories of the cigarillos will be in the Aroceros area. And uh, when you take a look at the documents, uh, the men folk were really uh, prone to uh, smuggling out cigarettes, hiding it in their, in their pants, in their uh, hats, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, for women, as far as I know, no woman uh, did no, attempt to smuggle out cigars from the factory. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, this one is um, um, a print showing women uh, walking towards the uh, Fabrica de Tabacos. So this uh, was located before beside the Binondo Church. So you have the Binondo Church and the, in this print, number one there, is uh, labeled or identified as Casa de la Dirección. In other words, that was the office of the Monopoly, Tobacco Monopoly. And number two will be the Fabrica de Tabacos. No? So uh, at that time of the Monopoly, you would have a factory in Binondo, uh, a factory in uh, Arroceros for the cigarillos. There was a factory in Malabon, and a factory also in Cavite. Also, those were the four major uh, uh, fabricas, not the tobacco. Okay, and you know, um, okay, uh, uh, one 19th century visitor said, why, why do there are so many women? Where are they going? And uh, upon questioning, uh, he found out that they were uh, uh, going to work. You know? Uh, in the tobacco factory. Next slide, please. Now, the Fabrica de Tabacos in Binondo uh, consisted of 380 tables. They're organized according to tables. And you had for these 380 tables, 4,300 cigarreras work. Uh, they were producing cigars for export to Europe and India. Kaya yung ang tinatawag na Fabrica de Menas, Finos very good quality, no? uh, good quality uh, cigars. The Fabrica de Menas Corrientes, uh, consisting of 180 tables with a workforce of 2,330 women, were making the regular kind of uh, to, uh, cigars. Okay, next slide, please. Now, so this is how they work. Uh, this is not from the Fabrica, uh, actually, because after the end of the uh, monopoly, government monopoly, uh, there were many entrepreneurs who opened uh, cigar uh, factories, you know, like for example here. But uh, uh, I just wanted to show you how they are uh, organized. They, they're seated on the floor in front of a low table. There would be about 10 to 12 women uh, on this table. So uh, that's how they are organized, you know? okay? Uh, and I'll explain to you uh, what they are assigned to do. It's like an assembly plan. Next slide, please. So here, uh, another, sh uh, this now is uh, uh, probably late 19th century. They were now seated uh, on the front of a raised uh, table. And like before that uh, they were seated on the floor in front of a low table. Next slide, please. Okay, you are a woman trimming cigars, uh, meaning that they had to take a look. Um, uh, the ends should be nicely trimmed. You know? uh, okay, next slide. Uh, now aided my machines towards the, you know, at the turn of when the Americans came in, uh, the cigarreras were still there. You know? They were, uh, actively involved and the industry was still alive until later on the cigars would be replaced by cigarettes. Huh? Okay, next slide, please. Okay, 
These are women stripping tobacco leaves. So they're not in the assembly line of tables, but their task would be uh, a stripping tobacco leaves. Next slide. Okay, so uh, this one, when the monopoly went into private hands, uh, the factory will be like a house like this on the left. And uh, on the right, uh, inside or the interior of the uh, building, you have women seated still on the floor no? and uh, rolling cigars. Next slide. Okay, another photo of women uh, seated on the floor and uh, showing an assembly like uh, uh, way of working. Next slide. Okay, how are they uh, organized? They are grouped according to tables with about 10 to 11 women around each table. Two women were tasked to moisten, stretch, and remove the stem. Seven rolled the cigars, while one counted, bundled, and weighed the cigars. Those assigned the task of rolling cigars were provided a stone as large as a lemon with which to beat the tobacco leaf. Once the leaf was rendered pliable, the cigarera would put a small quantity of chop to bake at the center of the leaf, a little gum on one end, and then would roll it to its desired form. No? So you can just imagine uh, the noise, the noise of beating, no? uh, uh, and you know, for the Spaniards, since this was a, an industry which was very profitable, most foreign, uh, visitors of the Philippines in the 19th century were always uh, made to visit no, a tobacco uh, factory. And um, so they enter the factory and, uh, you know, the women, when they see these visitors, they, they make more, um, more sound. No? They, so, so as if to, uh, you know, kid or joke the, uh, the visitor. Next slide, please. Now the working conditions would be uh, here. They will work from six in the morning up to 12 noon, and then from two in the afternoon until six. So they go home for lunch. So it's important that their home will be just walking distance from the factory. And then she would be subjected to two bodily uh, inspections in a day. One when she goes off for lunch, and the other when she leaves the fabrica at the end of the day. Also, uh, kinakapkapan. And then penalties were imposed on badly rolled cigars, as well as packing of tobacco in excess of the expected way. Uh, for future of a day's wage was the usual punishment. Uh, the cigarette earned an average of two pesos a month. Okay, next slide, please. Now, when the uh, monopoly ended, there were many private factories which emerged. One of them was the Insular Cigar and Cigarette Factory. Uh, it's part of the postcards during the uh, late 19th century. Next slide. Another one was Tabacalera. No? Uh, it uh, assumed the task of the state monopoly from cultivation to manufacturing uh, and to marketing. So uh, Tabacalera became a very good uh, replacement of the state uh, monopoly. Next slide. And this is their factory, no? uh, Fabrica de Tabacos of the uh, Tabacalera. Next slide, please. So, in 1892, 10 years, let's say, after the uh, uh, end of the monopoly, you have already a list of about 14 uh, tobacco factories. No? Uh, I got this from the Guia de Forasteros. And uh, you have there, the, uh, of course, the uh, Tabacalera, as was well, a leading one. Uh, then you have La Montañas, Nesa. Uh, La Constancia in San Marcelino. Uh, uh, just take a note of where they're, uh, no, they're um, uh, located because that would explain why you have many women in Binondo, for example, because most of the factories were in Binondo. 
So uh, you have La Exportadora in Cervantes Binondo, La Favorita in Andruagi, La Flor de Filipinas in Binondo, Poblete, La Insular in, in uh, Echague, in Quiapo, Maria Cristina in Goite, uh, Santa Cruz. Next slide, please. Uh, La Honrades in Binondo, Escolta, La Genciana in Binondo, David, Calle David, La Minerva in Calle Jaldo, Binondo, El Oriente in Quiapo, and Para Usted in San Jerónimo, Quiapo. Okay. Next slide, please. Now we'll go next to the second leading, the same stress, La Costurera. I, I never imagined that there were that many, you know. But anyway, their number, uh, just like the cigarera, you know, I will confess that when I got interested in the cigarera, I didn't realize that they were a dominant uh, sector of, uh, of society because what struck me about the cigarera before was their, um, their uh, let's say, audacity to stage a strike which the Spanish authorities referred to as just a tantrum, no? Parang uh, alboroto, sabi, alboroto de cigarreras de Manila. So I saw a document like that. And when you read about it, it's really a huelga. But since the uh, one who was reporting was male and tended to, you know, uh, uh, let's say, diminish the importance of their act, or action, it, they labeled it as a tantrum when the cigarreras did not report to work. No? But anyway, so uh, I, I, uh, I was really surprised with the big number of cigarreras in Manila at the time. The second one were, were the costrera, no? the uh, seamstress. Now, of course, she was indispensable since everyone, everything was hand sewn from clothes, bed linens, tablecloths, etc. No? Now, she, according to uh, literature, she leaves her house to go to the home of her customer with a thimble in her finger and a needle tuck in her bun. So parang naging pink cushion yung kanyang uh, bun. Uh, and because of their great number, their services were cheap. Below is a folk song featuring the costurera. Next slide, please. Okay. So this is a folk song about a costurera, and it reads, Ange is my name, dressmaking is my trade, all day long till evening, my poor hands are always sewing. No matter how hard I work, not a penny I can save. Alas, I can earn only just enough for food and rent. So uh, you can just imagine, um, uh, the life uh, of a costurera. Next slide, please. Now, according to an English businessman, a costurera was part of his household, whom he paid or whom she he paid, yes, uh, six dollars a month. And then there's also a woman who mentions the costurera, and she says, "When I arrived here, a seamstress worked nine hours a day." for 20 cents gold in her dinner. Now in Manila, a seamstress working for Americans receives 50 cents gold and sometimes 75 cents and her dinner. No? Though the Spanish, Filipinos, and Chinese pay less. So in other words, the entry of uh, foreigners who would uh, you know, uh, get the services of a costurera was really pulling up the wages of this uh, of these women no? uh, because they were getting really uh, they were being paid uh, higher than uh, the usual or what Ange would uh, would have received. Next slide, please. Now the costurera will be working with the cinemayera, no, uh, and the burdadora. The Sinamayera is a, a woman who sells textiles. And you will see here in this print that they are pictured in this manner. Uh, both of them are Sinamayeras. So one, 
In other words, one striking similarity of the two is they have in their left arm, left arm textiles. No? So that gives them away that these are Sinamayeras because they have textiles under their arm. And then we see here now a difference because you have the one on the left holding a yardstick and on the left hand and a, uh, probably a list of uh, her merchandise on the right. Now here on the right, you have the Sinamayera opening her stall uh, and most probably uh, located in Calle Rosario in Binondo. Now these two women, as you will see, are a bit fashionista because they have to be walking advertisements of their trade. And uh, in literature, if you take a look at some of the literature written in the 19th century, these were women who were belonging to the upper uh, crust of society. In fact, two, uh, two sisters or two aunts of Pedro Paterno uh, were Sinamayeras. No? They were engaged in this particular business. So they were entrepreneurs uh, in a sense. Okay, next slide, please. And the third will be the Burdadoras. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, Ermita and Malate were the two Arabales, which were known for the skill, their skill Burdadoras. And testimonies of their skill were written by foreign travelers of the Philippines in the 19th century. Among them were John Bowring, the British governor of Hong Kong, Jean Mala, uh, the French doctor, Fyodor Yagor, the German scholar, and Commander John Wilkes, head of the United States Exploring Expedition in 1859. Next slide, please. Okay, so the testimonies. You have John Bowring saying, quote, La Ermita and other villages are remarkable for their burdadoras who produce their exquisite piña handkerchiefs for which large sums are paid. A small handkerchief costs one or two ounces of gold. Close quote. Next slide. Jan Mala says, when the piña is plain, which is not usual, one has it embroidered by the embroiderers of Ermita and Malate, near Manila or Intramuros, who excel in this kind of work. The embroideries that they turn out offer proof of an almost unbelievable patience. They are uh, an admirable beauty which, could, which would be impossible to imitate in Europe. The most notable and pleasing are those called desilados and roscalados. These are open work embroideries. Next slide, please. Yagor would say in the Philippines, where the fineness of the work is best understood and appreciated richly, embroidered costumes of this description have fetched more than 20,000 reals each. And lastly, you have, next slide, Charles Wilkes saying, uh, this is uh, lifted from Piña by Lourdes Montinola, Commander Charles Wilkes, who headed a United States exploring expedition in 1842, paid a visit to one of the houses of Manila, presumably in Ermita, where skilled women were embroidering piña. A great variety of dresses, scarves, caps, collars, cuffs, and pocket handkerchiefs were demonstrated. Next slide, please. Now, uh, I remember Dr. Ko, no? she uh, wrote something about uh, uh, the manner of dressing in the 19th century. And of course, we see uh, Pictures like this is our embroidered piña. You can see how intricate you know, uh, it is. It comes plain, but it is embroidered, you know, hand uh, embroidered. Next slide, please. And it's very uh, gossamer. They call it sometimes nipis because it's very gossamer. You know? uh, and next slide, please. Another uh, picture of a, an embroidered piña. Up to now, piña is really very expensive. No? So you can just imagine that uh, what the foreigners were saying about piña was uh, not uh, really a joke. No? They had appreciation for it. 
Next slide, please. So you have uh, Burdadoras, I think this were late 19th or early uh, 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 20th century, so late. So you see uh, women uh, engage uh, in uh, embroidery. Uh, sometimes uh, they were part of uh, the educational uh, curriculum. Next slide, like this one. And next slide. Okay, for picture taking purposes. So you can see why the um, why you had costureras needed, no? Because uh, just from the pictures that uh, we see, they really had to be, uh, you know, you had to get their assistance or their service to make uh, our clothes. Next slide. Okay. The lavanderas is the third, the third leading. And the uh, laundry was collected from uh, homes and brought to uh, nearby Estero, usually a tributary of the Pasig River. Of course, now you cannot imagine it, but before the Pasig River was clean, we suppose, no? uh, cleaner than now what we see today. And uh, so it's collected and it's laundered in uh, at nearby Estero and soap may be purchased in Calue Caboneros in Binondo. No? Uh, the, the, the name of the street is named is af named after uh, soap. No? And Mala, the French doctor mentioned that they were paid 10 pesos monthly. Okay, next slide. So you see uh, our uh, lavanderas, uh, and uh, the, the laundry is dried on a grass. It's uh, where some, you see, there is a clothesline. Some are, unless ito ay pinapakula pa nila, and then they again wash it, and then uh, um, hang no? in a clothesline. Next slide, please. Or uh, in this manner, no? like I said, it's uh, made to dry uh, uh, on a grass. Okay, next slide. Okay, the fourth. We'll beat it in deras, no? Uh, and you see them, uh, the object of prints or uh, photos. So you have on the left a print uh, saying that this is a tindera, the, uh, I see this is a fruit, no? Uh, fruit vendor. Now uh, on the right will be a photo. I, I, it seems that they're just outside the wall of Intramuros and they are ambulant uh, uh, peddlers, but we really don't know what they would be uh, selling. Okay, next slide. Okay, this will show the lichera. The lichera is uh, coming from the word leche. Milk, so they are milkmaids, kumbaga. So they're milk vendors, and uh, you know, um, on the left uh, you have in black and white print of a lichera, and uh, on the right will be a more uh, lively uh, uh, illustration of the uh, lichera. And uh, the lichera is um, uh, one who probably has the best physical stamina because. She starts delivering her milk at four in the morning. No? She makes her rounds at four in the morning, walking from Tundo. Tundo was the usual source of, uh, of uh, uh, carabao milk. No? We, we will we'll think of carabao milk. And then um, she would uh, finish by early morning of six, and they would congregate in, um, in Binondo. Uh, and then her second round will be at four o'clock in the afternoon. So she does her uh, milk deliveries twice a day uh, at four in the morning and four in the afternoon. So you have the, in the left, the lichera and the panadero on the right uh, in this uh, other print. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, so this one, uh, as uh, will be seen, um, these are tinderas. Also, one is a tindera ng isda, no fish. Uh, 
and on the right will be a tindera of uh, uh, clay pots. Next slide, please. A tindera di banig no, on the left and a tindera uh, of rice. No, that you have a ganta, that, that's the measuring uh, uh, thing of, of rice. Now we, we uh, weigh rice by the kilo, but uh, before these were boxes and they had a corresponding weight and uh, that one will be a ganta of rice. That's why they call it a ganta of rice. Next slide. Okay, the buyera. The buyera is the one on the left. And uh, the buyera is so uh, usually uh, stationed in uh, side box, you know? and um, she usually will have this uh, elevated uh, sort of uh, platform. She has this platform, and we see her busy with uh, the ingredients of the betel nut chew or the uh, buy. So you have the betel nut chew. Uh, and you have the ingredients there. I think she's, uh, she's holding on something white, which would be the lime. Then uh, on top of the box would be her bunga, which is your betel nut. And then on her bilao, she would have her ikmo. So these are the three ingredients of the betel nut chew. Uh, you have the lime, you have the bunga, and the ikmo. And well, stories uh, will say, that her uh, stall was uh, usually um, uh, a, a favorite place of the males, no? So, uh, because of course you look at her, she's very pretty Anaman. But anyway, uh, she, uh, she would prepare uh, your betel nut chew depending on uh, her interaction with you because of course, uh, she, they say that if she uh, likes the, the man or dislikes the man, she will show it to the um, betel nut chew. No? So if you uh, medyo, uh, type niya si uh, binata or lalaki, he would, she would make a very uh, delicious betel nut chew. No? But not, if not, he will, she will make it a bitter better than two. So it's a sort of a non-verbal communication. And of course you have there uh, alongside uh, would be uh, something to masticate as well because the Bennett metal nut chew is something that you masticate or you chew and you also have the uh, tubo, no? the sugar cane, which can also be a refreshing um, thing to masticate after the better nut chew. And of course the carindiria. Uh, very interesting uh, because you see all of them, the, 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 the food there is all colored very attractively. And you have only rice there. Uh, and then the uh, customer seated on a dulang or a low table as well. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so as I conclude, I would notice that as I said, I was very surprised when I was preparing this um, uh, uh, lecture, I didn't realize that the cigarettes really were that many until I went through the vicindarios because these vicindarios were something that, uh, well, of course, were used in my book, but I didn't get to really uh, analyze them. And it was only now that I, uh, the figures, the evidence of their presence really shouted through the vicendarios. So for me, uh, the cigarreras were the first factory workers of Manila. They were known for their skill in rolling cigars. They were also the first overseas workers. I realized this because there's a book written by Otto Busingberg who said that uh, some of the Dutch uh, recruited cigarreras in the Philippines and were sent to Surabaya in Indonesia to teach the women there to roll cigars. No? Because the Dutch also introduced the culture system 
uh, in the Dutch East Indies, and they were also into uh, cultivation of uh, tobacco. So that was something very refreshing for me that uh, uh, overseas workers in the persons of the cigarreras already existed uh, during the time, uh, during the Spanish period. Then the Custureras, Cinemayeras, and Burladoras, parang they were a, uh, a, a, a guild or a group which worked together to cloth the denizens of Manila and its arabales. And of course, the lavanderas and tinderas provided valuable services to the residents of Manila. Okay, thank you for listening. <laughs>